Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Run It Back, and I am joined once again by Maria Ho. We are watching High Stakes Poker, so sit back, relax, enjoy the show, grab yourself a drink. But first and foremost, we have to check back in. Maria, how are you doing? Uh, well, I've got a wine in hand, so I'm going to say pretty. Well, <laughs> I love this. Uh, this is a one of my favorite routines of the Thursday night. Thursday becomes Friday if you're having a beverage at night and you're just watching some poker. It really helps me get through that Friday when I know that I have a good Thursday. Um, I'm having a Topo Chico, which is a um, uh, it's a twist of lime flavored uh, sparkling water. Not really my usual choice. However, I'm doing a big sporting event on Saturday, so I'm trying to be very, very good. Carb loading, which is also a lot of fun. But anyway, what have you been up to? Uh, how is quarantine treating you? Are you sick of it yet, or have you found any new hobbies? Well, first, I have to say I'm kind of disappointed that I lost my run it back drinking buddy for the night, but uh. it's okay. I understand. Um, everything's been good on my end, honestly. I like my slogan during this entire period has just been stay safe, <laughs> stay sane. And um, I feel like I'm doing both pretty well. So, um, I mean, I can't complain just keeping busy, you know? Right. Right. Uh, I saw you made an appearance on the uh, super high roller bowl online series with the wonderful uh, Jeff Platt and the, I mean, less than the wonderful Brent Hanks, but, um, obviously tons of online action going on. Have you been, have you been dabbling? Have you been like having some fun in the online streets or are you using this time to study a little bit? A little bit of both, actually. I have been playing a bit online. It's hard to stay away because obviously the prize pools are ginormous right now and the series just are never ending. But I'm not one of those people that can grind, you know, like 10, 12 days on end. So I definitely need a break. So on those breaks, I am doing quite a bit of studying. Nice. Well, we are watching season seven of High Stakes Poker and look how young Norm MacDonald looks on this broadcast. I mean, wow. I, he looks hot. He, he, he doesn't look like Norm Macdonald. He looks like a Norm Macdonald imposter, to be honest. And that's like a just like a nice suit on him. It's just a good look for him. Because nowadays, you know, when you see Norm, he's more of a like <laughs> chill attire type of guy. So Yeah, that's totally true. You mean you mean pajama pants in public. That's <laughs> that's sort of Norm's uh, go to right now. Um, we are watching this episode, which features, as you can see on the screen, let me pause it there for a second. Antonio Esfendiari, Phil Ruffin, Viffer, of course, David Pete, but everybody knows him as Viffer, uh, Doyle Brunson, Robert Krog, Bear Greenstein, Vanessa Selbst, and Bill Klein. For people who are tuned in to the most recent show with Igor Kurganov. We watched the first two episodes of season seven. This is the third one of season seven. So if you were with us on Tuesday morning, then this is a continuation of that action. A shout out to everyone who tuned in uh, last week and who's here now. If you have any questions for Maria Ho, please make sure to let us know in the chat. And also don't forget to like this video, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, it helps us a lot. So we are watching some high stakes poker. Maria, we watched Poker After Dark the last time with you, Holidays with Helmuth where mm -hmm. you were basically pushing those guys around which was amazing <laughs> to watch a lot of fun high stakes poker though what's your relationship with this show because you never got to play on it but you were probably a big fan as well I was definitely a big fan I remember watching it and being like what I love is the, the bricks of cash that they have right in front of them it just makes it so real the stakes that they're playing for and of course some of these characters aside from the obvious known pros but people like Viffer you know who now have largely disappeared from the poker scene those entertaining. Oh. Yeah, I know. You broke up there for just a second, but I think you said it was very entertaining, which is, is something I can only concur with. Um, Greenstein getting mixed in here right away. Did you have any favorites on this show? As we are seeing, by the way, Bill Klein shove all in with Ace King there. I mean, it's always nice to see Doyle in the mix. You know, we know that he doesn't love to play No Limit Hold'em. That's not his, like, favorite game. But when he gets in there, he's still willing to, you know, be as aggressive as the rest of them. So it's just nice to watch him play. But, you know, Viffer was such a crazy character on these shows. And I, you know, I obviously got to play a little bit with him and chat with him during this time when he was playing a lot of these uh shows and i just thought that he had you know just a fun demeanor at the table absolutely let's see how this um, showdown goes as barry decided to call with ace queen big call against bill klein yeah i mean i feel like i feel like barry's mo is not necessarily to get it all in with ace queen pre 
but I mean, maybe Klein just had a reputation, which I think he still does a little bit, but you know, Klein's, he's, he's the type of player that he likes to play a lot of hands. He likes to get involved, but it's pretty interesting to see him stick it in free with ace queen. Though. I know ace queen. I mean, that's one of those sort of problem hands, which goes to show right now. It definitely was a problem for Barry, but two pair on the board to split the pot for him. Um, Maria, how close did you ever get? To playing on high stakes poker was it ever a conversation did you ever try to sneak in there uh, were you on a list of some kind to tell me the story uh i would say not very close i mean this was probably when i first started playing poker definitely did not have the role to play on this show and i was never somebody that would go and solicit people to like back <laughs> me in higher stakes i'm not saying that this wasn't a beatable lineup i'm just saying that um i wasn't willing to risk the little bankroll that i did have at the time i would have had like the equivalent of like a 15 big line stack probably right so your your bankroll which is an interesting topic and i think many people who are in the chat right now have their own sort of idea of how to manage their bankroll how to progress up the stakes and what to do with the money they have to spare to play poker with so how did your bankroll evolve did you go broke a few times did you sort of gradually make it up the stakes because obviously back in 2007 when you made your first big run in the main event that must have been a huge boost but what happened after that yeah well when i made that deep run in 2007 i was still just primarily a cash game player so when i got that infusion to my bankroll i was like well i could you know just put this all into cash games or i could maybe do something where 50 percent of it goes into my tournament bankroll and then i put 50 percent of it into my cash game big roll. Don't worry, I didn't set any money aside for like life expenses no. or anything. <laughs> Just split it right <laughs> down the middle for poker and poker only. Um, but um, it definitely kind of got me more into the tournament circuit just because I was able to play more tournaments. And of course I was bitten by the bug because anytime you make a deep run in a tournament, you're like, oh, tournaments are so much better than cash games. And then you realize that they're not. Um, but I definitely went, you know, I went broke maybe once early on, but I definitely went close to being broke a few times. And I really had to just humble myself to be like, okay, you got to start over. You got to rebuild. You got to move down stakes. And I think like a lot of people that I know have a story similar to that. And I just have to say that you have to be willing to play within your means. And it, it's never a good idea to have your whole role on the table. So. You sure? Is that, is that not a, a, <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate adrenaline rush? The last, the, the, the case money on the table? I, I can't I can't say it is for me. Like I'm no Bryn Kenny, so uh, people in the chat, let us know what are your bankroll blow ups, what are some crazy stories that you've been through? What are some maybe some big moments where you really, you know, put it out there and, and made a big run? I certainly think that everyone has sort of a story like that, you know, case money on the table, or at least buying into a tournament that you really shouldn't be playing and then you go on a bit of a run. That's always the most exciting thing. Um Cash games and tournaments, do you still sort of try to find a mix there or is it mostly that you can fo only can only focus on one thing nowadays because of how specialized all these top players are getting? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's definitely the latter. I feel like it is so specialized and there's so many big differences in the way that you should be approaching cash games versus tournaments that now I've unfortunately fallen into the trap of being a MTT pro, Ooh. which I can't say <laughs> is the most fun, but um, because I feel like I've dedicated a lot of time to studying that format, I kind of want to keep sticking to it, but I do miss, miss the cash game grind. And I just feel like the cash game lifestyle is so much more fun. Yeah, cash games is a very different realm almost. I feel like a lot of the cash game players never even interact with the tournament scene. And then we, and I'm speaking about sort of the people covering the scene, all of a sudden see some guy showing up in a big tournament. You're like, who is this guy? And it's like, oh yeah, he's a crusher. He plays like 200, 400, and he's like super, super good. So for us, it's always funny to see what happens in the cash game world. Um, one of the players that we're watching right now, Vanessa Selps, talking to Kara Scott here on season seven and showing off some of her trophies of which she of course has many winning Partouche Poker Tour, uh, NAPT. Um, seeing Vanessa here, and I know you're, you're good, good friends with her. Um, what, what was that like, you know, having someone that you're friendly with on this show? Yeah, it's awesome. And of course, like, I have to point out the obvious, which is she's a female. So it's nice to see a female battle it out on these type of shows for these type of stakes. And 
it's a well-deserved position that she earned for herself. We are good friends, but beyond that, I've always respected her as a poker player. And I know that she has that desire to win and compete with the best of them. And I feel like she has shown throughout her whole career that, you know, she belongs in these type of settings and the stakes won't rattle her. The people she's playing against don't rattle her. Okay. I take that back. She gets a little rattled. (laughs) She gets a little rattled, but like in a different kind of way. Like she's not intimidated by this environment is what I'm trying to say. But we all know she gets a little rattled. (laughs) So Vanessa Selves is one of my all time favorite players to watch just because how much she cares and how little Mm -hmm. she likes giving up on any hand. And on the previous episode, which I was watching with Igor, uh, we definitely saw some of that where, you know, she just wasn't backing down. And um, I believe there's an episode later in the season where Phil Ruffin three bets her on the flop and she still sticks it in with Queens on a nine high board. And Ruffin turns over a set and she's disgusted by it. And like the (laughs) fact that she's so disgusted, like is... It's just like that, 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 I don't know, the competitive drive that she has is just, I don't know. I, I love watching that and seeing her in the setting. She is very comfortable, which is really cool to see as well, because I believe this was her debut on the show. And of course, Jennifer Harmon played in prior seasons. Uh, Mimi Tran played on season one. Many people forget that. Uh, but it is pretty cool to have a female presence at the table. Do you think, Maria, that for other women that either play poker or aspire to play poker, it helps to see a, a woman in a lineup like this? Yeah, I can't see how it wouldn't help. I mean, I know that when I was coming up in the game, just seeing other women succeed kind of made me feel like, hey, I could do it too. Because it's so obvious when you walk into a card room that you are the minority and that there aren't a lot of people in that room that look like you. And so that can be intimidating and daunting for anybody. And so just to see someone compete at the highest levels, it just makes you feel like one day you can get there and that there will be this like acceptance of your presence in that situation. Definitely. I definitely agree with that. Uh, shout out, by the way, to Sean, Nathaniel, Rich, Edgar, Lee, uh, Dr. Raberry, and a whole bunch of people on Facebook as well. It's hard to keep up with the chat. People love Maria. Did you tell the Maria, was it Maria gang to, to show up for this? Uh, for Wait, there's... Well, okay. So first tell, off, tell me hashtag this. Maria mob. mob. But also, sorry. I had a thing that was like Maria's homies. So you know what? Whatever it is that we call them, they're awesome. Um, I did, you know, put it out on Twitter and Instagram and told people this is where I'd be. So thank you for joining us. And I hope you guys are drinking with me because Remco isn't. Yeah, I know. I'm a huge fail on the show today, but please let us know where you're watching from and what you're drinking and, you know, show some support for Maria. I see Chelsea, Lawrence, Steve, Will, um, Aaron, uh, Stuart, Mitchell, Will, tons of people in the chat. Let us know what your questions are. And I got a good one already from uh, Dr. Rabiri on YouTube. He says, what is the highest stakes that Maria Ho has ever played? Well, what's the story there? What's the highest stakes you've ever played? And how did you end up in that lineup? Uh, I have played like 500, 1,000 no limit before. And there would be, you know, a straddle at times. And how did I end up in that lineup? Why did I play those stakes? Yeah, what, what, were, you, what were you doing there? <laughs> Um, well, you know, like on Poker After Dark, I've played as high as like 200, 400, 800. So I feel like that's that's a threshold that I do feel somewhat comfortable with. This 500, 1,000 game was pretty special, though, because of the players involved. So for me, um, not only is it like a question of can my bankroll um, sustain it, but if it's a really good lineup, then I will take a shot, especially in a cash game format, because as you guys all know, in a tournament situation, you get knocked out and an unlucky that's it for you but in a cash game if it's you know filled with whales and fun players then <laughs> you can just buy back in and hopefully get another chance to get your money back and then some so it was just a really good lineup it was in LA and it was in a home game and I wish I could say like I feel like I should know definitively whether I won or lost and I don't really so I feel like I must have just like broke even or won a little bit or lost a little bit and it was just nothing to write home about because I I mean I think I remember a six figure win. <laughs> I mean the most baller part of this story is the fact that you can't really remember which is <laughs> which is sort of cool. Uh, by the way we have Dola Brunson here shoving on Vanessa Selves with a seven of hearts on a two heart flop against Vanessa who flopped the lower end of the straight. Um, I can't see Vanessa getting away from this, uh, so let's listen in. What do you want to do? I don't care. Oh, he, she already called, by the have? way. For sure. Just want to see how many times they want to run this. Yeah. Oh, wow. Made a queen. 
Yeah, twice a guess, so. Twice <laughs> it is. So the funny thing is, is Doyle always lets the other player decide whether to run it twice. But in this situation, they're just going back and forth, and Doyle immediately says, yeah, we'll do it twice. Like, he is so smart with this stuff. It is really funny to see how uh -huh. sort of, I don't know, I wouldn't say sly, but it is really clever the way Doyle handles these situations. Because when he's ahead, he never makes any fuss about running it twice. But now, of course, <laughs> he just steps on it right away. Let's see who wins this hand. I guess I walked out at a good time. You did. There's kind of a small pot going on. Every time Antonio leaves the room, somebody goes all in. So they're going to run it twice, Aunt Ida. What that means is they're going to play the hand twice. And Each time Ida. for half the pot. I have one person in the room. There's half to Doyle. Oh, she's <laughs> thieving! She's thieving! If he does it again, oh. he'll win the whole pot. Is she one of your favorite oh, mad poker players? Yeah, that face. And she just doesn't even hide her emotion. That's the funny part. She has to catch one of those. a queen this time. Not on the turn. She's like holding her breath, I feel like. <laughs> and not on the river. Chop, chop. It's a pretty big sweat there on the river. You can exhale, Vanessa. <laughs> she is probably just as mad chopping or like losing both. Like she's just like super mad. Like a hundred percent. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, people in the chat asking, Jose is asking what season is this? This is season seven and all seven seasons of high stakes poker are available on poker go in anticipation of the return of high stakes poker, which will be happening once Corona is sort of dealt with. And we've had a safe way to tape a new show at the poker go studio in Las Vegas. So look forward to a new season of high stakes poker. And please, you know, find the rest of those seasons on Boca Go right now. And you know what? I think for this iteration, I might be able to afford to play in a oh. couple of them. <laughs> oh, let it be heard. Let it be heard. You're, <laughs> are, are you, do you have like a, a hollow mattress and you're, st you're putting away <laughs> money for this big night? Yeah, I mean, and luckily I feel like I know who to get in touch with to ask about if I can be on the show or yeah, not. Yeah, I so. happen to have his phone number too. He calls me all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, shout out to Brent Hanks, by the way, who is putting the lineups together for High Stakes Poker. I have seen, I have seen the short list of people that are, you know, interesting and cool and that might want to play. And it's not really a short list. It's a very long list. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, let us know in the chat which players you would like to see on the return of High Stakes Poker. Of course, Maria being one of them. But any other players that you might have in mind, please let us know in the chat. And maybe you'll drop a name that we hadn't considered. And that might be someone that Brent Hanks has to um, reach out to. Um, I saw another question here in the chat. Let me go and find it. Um, Farjala Mohammed is asking... Um, what are the best players of all time, the top three, according to Maria? What, what, what do you think? I mean, this is a super tough question. I think there's many different ways to answer this, but, you know, give it your own spin uh, and give me a top three. Well, I mean, I feel like you were delving into this topic pretty recently on your Twitter, and I have to say that I agree. I know that there's kind of two schools of thought of how to rank the best players. And for me, you know, I agree with the maybe natural talent side of it. I know that there's so many players that put in so much work. And of course, they are some of the best. But when I think about who I think is the best, I think about people who have that X factor in the game who you know, may or may not have the most solid fundamentals, the most GTO approach, but the people that I feel like just have that natural knack and instinct and feel for the game. Um, because I have to say, you know, I've played against both somebody like Phil Ivey and Fader Holtz, and I felt more intimidated by Ivey than I did by Holtz, even though I know, you know, by far and away in some ways, Holtz is a, a what really well studied player but also just the way that he approaches the game is obviously in this new era of solvers which you can't really oppose that being probably a superior way of thinking but i just remember the first time i sat down with phil ivy i was like oh my god this i'm i'm so scared to play against him i'm so scared that he knows everything i'm doing and why i'm doing it and i literally didn't want to bluff him because of that so I guess top three. It's still so hard, though. God. So you're you're um, you're going the talent route, like top three most talented players, because top three best players of all time is is such a 
strange yeah. way of thinking about it from my perspective. For sure. It, it, it really is. I mean, yeah, I have to say just sheer talent. Yeah, I'm going to have to go with. Uh, I'm going to have to go with Phil Ivey. Um, then I'll go with somebody like probably somebody like Scott Seaver. Um, I know like his name was put out there in the mix a lot, but every time I play with Scott, it just feels like he, he, he knows how to, you can just tell that the way his brain works, he's able to figure things out on the fly that people who may not have a solver or, you know, access to it right in front of them, they might not be able to figure out, but you could see Scott's wheels turning all the time. And I feel like he just kind of like sees it like Rain Man um, <laughs> in the times that I played with him. And then I would say, I would say like Bryn, I, I think Bryn has shown, and maybe it just has to do with a little bit of that natural talent plus heart, but I think that Bryn plays in a way that I feel like only somebody who has a lot of heart but also trusts their instincts completely could do. I mean, again, I wouldn't say this is my definitive top three best players of all time, but these are just some names that come to mind. 100%. And there's other names that we could throw in the mix there. Stu Unger, Chip Reese, Doyle Brunson, Jungle Man, Tom Dwan, Victor Blom. I just want to rattle them off because I know you're thinking about those guys as well. And I think, you know, there's an argument to be made for, you know, any of these names in any particular order. Um, but yeah, if you guys want to see uh, a, a Twitter thread with more than 500 responses. Go to my Twitter at Remco Rinkema. It's the pinned tweet where I put out my top 10 list of the most talented poker players. Obviously, that list is never done. It's never finished. And it's also never set in stone. But it is a fun exercise to think about. And if you're saying, well, what about this guy? Well, then go make your own top 10. Send it to me. And then I can criticize your list. Because it is really <laughs> hard to leave someone off Super from this hard. list. Um Shout out to people in the chat. Um, uh, Josh, Mihai, uh, Samuel, Zachary, Mo the Cat. Thank you all so much for being with us here. Lots of questions coming in uh, from players and, and people in the chat here. Oh, this is actually a fun question from Samuel. Um, have you ever lost your cool at the table and gotten into it with another player? You always seem so cool at the table at all times. Well, have you ever lost your cool? Oh, I, I have. There's two particular instances. I do feel like I am good at keeping an even keel and being calm just in general, because I feel like if I'm not, it affects my poker game. And also I never want someone to feel like they're getting to me. So whether it's them beating me in a hand or showing me a bluff or whatever, I just think that I lose the psychological edge if I react to it. Right. Um, but two times, the first time commerce casino cash game really early in my professional playing career, 40, 80 limit hold them. And I think commerce is pretty notorious for having, you know, some very rude clientele. Uh, there's a lot of dealer abuse that happens sometimes there. And just, you know, some other unsavory things that I think people have heard. And that was where I cut my teeth, you know, when I first started playing cash games for a living. And this guy, I just beat him out of maybe one pot. I really don't think I had beat him out of any other pots before this particular hand happened and it wasn't like this huge pot but he had just been losing all night and he basically stood up got in my face called me the c-word told me he was going to going to like kill my family what and and this probably isn't like the best person to like lose my cool against because he might be just unhinged and psychologically deranged but I also just feel like I can't really allow somebody to speak to me like that. So luckily, like floor men and maybe one person at the table came to my defense, but I definitely stood up and kind of got face to face with him and just said some stuff I don't remember, maybe to the effect of, you know, don't threaten me, don't threaten my family. And then very quickly, people kind of came and broke it up. But I, I definitely was not cool then. And I should have been more scared, I think, in retrospect, but I, I, a lot of adrenaline, obviously. And this, once again, proves that all Limit Hold'em players are total psychopaths. That's sort of what I'm, <laughs> what I'm getting from this story. Um, and you were ready to throw down, for sure, 100%. I, I was, because I just like, couldn't believe that somebody would go that far because they lost a, a hand. And also, you know, when you talk about my family, that's it. You know, it's over. Yeah, no, I mean, wow, that's an insane story. Wow. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely everyone's favorite um, son-in-law because I'm very polite at the table. Maria Ho is is 
once once the bomb goes off, we got ourselves a fight on our hands, which I kind of respect. That's kind of cool. Um, shout, shout out to everyone watching. Um, Will Neuer says 2021 WSP main event. I mean, yeah, the WSP should be going on right now. It is really weird. I drove by the Rio yesterday and I took a photo of the employee entrance. Maria, I know you use that entrance as well. It's the back entrance that, you know, us people that have been around the block for a few times know to take because it's much faster. And there was a sign WSOP employee entrance. And obviously there was another single car in sight, which kind of made me feel sad. Um, do you, do you think we will have a WSOP this, this year? Are you still optimistic? I feel like it's one thing to be optimistic, but it's another thing to think about whether it's practical or even safe. I'm a huge germaphobe as it is. So I think that out of safety reasons, I don't feel like there should be. I think it should just be canceled. I know that there's a lot of people still holding out hope that there will be one this year, but I feel like it's okay to take this year off. I know it's it's a bummer for sure, but you know, there's still a lot of options. I feel like we're so lucky because this is an industry and a game that's actually really thriving right now during all of this that's going on around us. And I feel like so many people have been able to rediscover their love for poker just in a different way, whether it's like online or playing home games with friends or whatever it is. And so I'm happy to see the WSOP come back next year, bigger and better than ever. But I think it's, it just makes sense to just have it canceled for the year. Yeah. We'll have to wait and see until any more news comes out. I know casinos in Vegas are slowly opening again. Uh, I think the, the target dates are somewhere next week. Uh, poker is part of some casinos reopening strategy, but not all of them. So we'll have to wait and see. I'm not going to go near a poker room for the next little while. I, I see there's no upside at all. Um, even winning a couple hundred bucks, you know, not really going to make a big difference for me. So I'm going to play it safe. And I think many players will also play it safe. And those that don't play, please be safe. And if you are playing in your local card room, you know, just adhere to the rules and I'm sure you can still have a good time, but it is a bit odd with all the, strange plexiglass windows and the the i don't know it i don't know it live poker for me is about having a drink and having fun and sitting back and relaxing and it's not the most relaxed environment if you uh, have to cover up in that sense um some more shout outs here uh, steve james um some guy named dave pete i hope it's the real viffer and if, if it is please <laughs> get in touch um uh, dale and a anthony let's see what we have here um john raul uh faik on Facebook, Lawrence again. Um, John is saying, I'm coming to Vegas in September. I hope there's at least tables going. I mean, in September, sure, there will be tables going for sure. Um, WSOP might even be happening in September. Who knows? We don't know anything. We're just waiting for some news on, on what may or may not go down. But to me, it feels as though, you know, smaller venues like the PokerGo Studio with a high buy-in event with a very small group of players, that is much more feasible and attainable than running the Big 50 with 20,000 people playing across four days. It's just a very, very different environment. Um, let's pick up another question here from the chat. Um, let's see. James Moore is asking, Maria, I'm a huge fan of your game and you're a great commentator. Besides a deep knowledge of the game, what are some of the tools you use to keep your insights and commentary fresh and fewer friendly? Hmm. Um, well, I remember the very first commentary gig I ever had, which was on Heartland Poker Tour. I remember just trying to put myself in the shoes of a player that, you know, plays more recreationally, isn't a professional, that's kind of wanting to have some takeaways from what they watch. I think poker should be the perfect balance. Poker on TV should be the poker perfect balance of entertaining, but also um, something that you can gain some insight and knowledge from. And so I would just put myself in the shoes of, okay, how would I approach a tournament if I'm somebody that only gets to maybe play this type of tournament four or five times a year? And I try to just really approach my commentary from that standpoint, because sometimes I know people will watch poker on TV and be like, wait, I don't understand why would this person do that? And the answer is not necessarily a theory based answer. The answer is completely um, a subjective answer that's dependent on maybe the dynamic that this person has established with the opponent that's involved in the hand, or maybe it's the dynamic of, okay, I really want to min cash because I just want to have that 
on my Hendon mob or I only play three or four big tournaments a year. And so I'm more in a survival mode than a, I want to play to win mode. And so I think those are things that sometimes commentators end up overlooking because they're so focused on explaining the theory. And while I think that is important, I also think that it's really, really important to try to understand the mindset of that type of player that's that you're commentating on. And so I think that's something that I always try to remind myself when I am doing commentary. Um, that's one way that I, you know, keep it fresh. And I also just realize it's important not to like talk over people's heads. It's because I think wanting to sound smart is natural for all commentators. Of course, you want to show off your knowledge and show off how much you know, but you also want to make sure that the people watching is able to understand and retain what you're saying. And so sometimes it's not about making yourself look good. It's about making sure that people who are watching has something that can, they can really take away from it. So, yeah, it's a, it's a funny thing you say that as well, because Norm Macdonald doing commentary here on High Stakes Poker is a very different style of commentary than, you know, the 50K Players Championship or the WSP Main Event or the Super High Roller Bowl. Those are just very, or like Heartland Poker Tour or, you know, a small cash game that's being broadcast like Friday Night Poker. Every single time you step into the booth, you have to realize what the audience is and what the stakes are and, and whether the players are drinking and, and having just having some fun or, you know, whether there's a different sort of vibe. And I think... High stakes poker because it's also made for TV has you know more of a comedic approach to the commentary, not necessarily focused on the strategy. Of course, you know, following the action, but very very different style. And I'm wondering for the people watching at home, what do you prefer? Do you like more strategy based commentary? Do you like more you know joking around and and, and making fun of the players a little bit? What's your preference? Because there's definitely many different styles. And Maria, do you have a special preference yourself when you're watching? Do you always want to be you know, taught something by a very, very smart, high-level player? Or is the comedic factor like high-stakes poker also something you can enjoy? Oh, it, the comedic factor is definitely something that I can enjoy, which is why I think it's so important when there are two commentators that the play-by-play -play person maybe does have more of a comedic style or more of a lighthearted approach. And then you bring a specialist in to, to analyze the hands because I think you do need that balance. And... Sometimes I'll sit down to watch poker purely as a fan, just because I want to have a drink, kick my feet up and watch something that I think is entertaining. And sometimes I watch poker as a learning experience. So I feel like depending on why that day I'm choosing to watch poker, that kind of lends itself to what show or what type of program that I'm going to end up watching. And like you said, you know, the high stakes, super high roller bowl stuff, when you're watching the best players in the world play, you do kind of want to get in their minds and you do want to understand a little bit of what it's like to play at that level. But if people are watching something like world series of poker, I feel like the entertainment value needs to be weighed really heavily there because most of those people are watching as a poker fan. Yeah, it's a very good, point and it's funny you said you know kick your feet up have a glass of wine and cheers once again uh, that's sort of the format of this show so in in that way we're doing the best of both worlds we're watching poker we're having some fun it's it's laid back and we're enjoying this with you guys who are watching at home and uh, thanks once again well for all the and questions. only but only one of us is having a drink though. yeah sorry i mean i'm <laughs> okay, how about this? Next time we do this, I'll take a shot right at the start of the show to make up for the missed drink. I wouldn't have signed up for this day of Run It Back if I knew that you weren't oh. going to be drinking. I just have to put that out there. Oh I kind of God. feel like I was misled. A little bit of false advertisement. You should have included that in the details, but that's okay. All right. Well, you signed the contract, so here we are. So we're just gonna we're gonna make it through this hour, and we're gonna we're gonna just uh, run with it. And then we'll we'll have you back on the show, and I'll do the shot as I promised, and I'll make up for that drink. And then you can you can pick whatever whatever I should be drinking. I have I have a lot of. Alcohol. I like that. I I, I want to get to pick. That's for sure. Okay. Good. We'll we'll do that. I have a lot of alcohol in the house, and don't don't make me do a shot of gin. That's disgusting. Um, I do like gin, but not uh, straight up. Um, lots of other questions coming in. A lot of people preferring strategy talk, which I can totally understand. It's definitely something that um, you can learn a lot from just watching poker and enjoying it. Um, people are also saying, I like Gabe Kaplan's style of commentary. Yes, the dryness of Gabe is is just unrivaled. Like there's no match for Gabe Kaplan. He's a, a legend and a hero. Uh, shout out to Kenneth. He says, hello. Hello, Kenneth. 
Thanks for, for joining us. Someone earlier said, can you give a shout out to my girlfriend, which is kind of funny. I think her name is Bella. I, I can't find the, the comment right now, but if you're watching, Bella, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, Gang Gang is asking... I hope this is your gang. Um, what are what are the best tips you can give someone who is just looking to improve? Like, is there is there one set way? You know, let's 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 assume this player you know plays low to mid stakes. One certain way that you like to study or get better at poker. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I feel like people learn differently, so that's why it's so hard to answer. I mean, some people are able to learn by watching somebody else do it and then maybe kind of mimicking or incorporating that. And some people learn better by do, by practicing and trial and error and actually sitting down and kind of messing with, you know, different styles of play. So, I mean, I feel like in general, when I was looking to improve, what really helped me was to watch a training video of somebody's, um, and I'm talking now specifically about uh, tournament play, um, somebody who would play and do a hand history review, I felt like that was very, very helpful for me because it just opened my eyes to other ways to think about a hand. And what I would do would I w was I would you know pause and play and stop and start it over and over again, just to kind of think, okay, what if I approach before he or she would say, okay, this is the way I approach this hand because I would think to myself, how would I approach the hand and compare that to uh, what the pro on the video would say. And I feel like there's some things that I think are really worth revisiting. So if you're looking to just get better, another thing to do is to just go over all of the things that you thought you knew already about poker. I think now more than ever, people realize that in order to play game theory optimal, you have to have really sound fundamentals. And the only way to know that you have sound fundamentals is to revisit these these preconceived notions in your mind of, okay, what are good starting hand ranges or what are good, you know, bet sizes for certain textures of flops. I feel like now people do those things so automatically just based on what they're used to, like whether they're used to raising, you know, 2.2 X preflop or three X or whether they're used to, you know, betting a third pot on dry boards and, you know, bigger on wet boards. I feel like it's important to go back and think, okay, am I just doing this because it's something that I've just gotten used to, or am I doing this because fundamentally and theoretically it all lines up with all of the new information and the new content that's been coming in about how the game is played and how people are studying the game. So I feel like what I did was I actually ended up teaching a friend of mine during uh, this period of time. I taught a friend that had never played poker before how to play. And it really made me revisit when I had to start from scratch and tell somebody, okay, this is what you should do in this situation. And I was like, okay, well, why do I think that that's the right thing to do? Is yeah. it because it, it it's, is it just because I've been doing it for so long or is there some actual, uh, things to back it up from all of the other things that I've learned now in my game. So, yeah, it's really funny because like you said, and I think many people can identify with this when someone who's new to poker asks, yeah, but why am I betting half the pot? I'm like, uh, yeah, I've just been doing that for a long time. And that's just <laughs> sort of what I got used to. Um, and it, I think it's a great point. And I think I'm just going to go on, out on a limb here. I think maybe the person you were teaching might've been part of the Friday night poker lineup that you put together <laughs> with Brent Hanks. And if, if it is the case, please do let me know because I want to revisit that a little bit because that it was so much fun to watch. And for the people who missed it, this is available on Poker Go if you want to watch this broadcast. It included Michael Sarah, a very, very, very loud Bruce Buffer, which was both funny and a little bit cringe every now and then. Um, and also we have Michael, Michael Ian Black, Maria, Brent Hanks. Sadly, he was invited. Um, uh, Tyson Apostle was in the lineup. I think I'm forgetting a few names, but that was so much fun. Please, how did you put this together? And, you know, did you, did you guys keep playing afterwards? Because it sounded like people were still ready to get into more action. Yeah, so um, that was not, I didn't teach anybody in okay. that lineup. I, I Okay, mm, I taught a little bit to Michelle Fitzgerald, who was on Survivor with, with uh, Tyson as well in this current season that just ended. Um, I did tell her a little bit about poker. She played once or twice before uh, we met each other, um, but that wasn't who I was referring to. Um, Stapes was also in the lineup, and Stapes helped me 
put together that lineup as well. So it was kind of a collaborative effort. But, you know, I it was funny because a lot of people did not know each other beforehand and had not ever met previously or played together. But I loved the vibe of how everybody just got together and the conversation flowed really well. I would love to do that lineup live someday. And honestly, I felt like we were in the twilight zone with Brent winning. So certainly that won't happen the next time we get together. And I was leaving out Michelle for one specific reason. I wanted to see if Jeff Platt was still watching. And yes, he is still with us because he pointed it out immediately that Michelle from Survivor uh, That's was, so good, Remco. I love that you did. <laughs> was also in the lineup. Uh, because Michelle was the person that I was thinking, maybe Maria was teaching Michelle how to play poker because she seemed both very excited, but also, you know, a little fresh, a little new to the game. And, you know, sadly, Brent had to take all her chips. Um, Michael Sarah, though, what a character. What a funny guy. Michael Ian, Bla Ian Black, by the way, same sort of deal. Um, these guys, you can tell they're real poker fans. What's it like for you to come across someone who you've seen on the big screen or maybe perform in some kind of way. We, we know a lot of musicians or athletes are also into poker. Seeing that those people have a passion for poker, the game that you've been spending so much time on yourself. Yeah, it's always really cool to see that somebody who clearly has a busy lifestyle and has a really thriving career that probably takes up a lot of their time that they've discovered poker and poker is the thing that they're passionate about and poker is the thing that they choose to do in their free time because as you said i noticed very quickly just how much people like michael sarah and michael ian black really love the game and we did end up playing one more sit and go after and there was one point I think really early on when I folded a hand to Michael Sarah on stream and he immediately asked me my thought process behind it. And he was very curious to um, kind of understand my thinking and tell me what he had and ask me if I thought he played it right. And I was like, wow, that's cool. That's somebody who really wants to learn and someone who obviously loves the game enough that they're not just sitting here saying like, oh, I'm just here to play for fun. They just want to get better. And they realize that there's a lot of skill to this game and they're really looking and leaning into it. Yeah, definitely. And obviously Michael Sarah was on Molly's Game, which I thought was an awesome movie. And he did a really good job portraying another actor, Tobey Maguire, which is sort of funny, an actor playing an actor on a movie where an actor played poker, which is, is a whole new level of dimensions that um, is sort of hard to unpack. But it is cool. And I do want to say, which is to your point, that this lineup should happen in, in real life. We should have this at the Poker Go studio. Um, what are the chances you're going to get all these people together in one room? I mean, I will say that like it, getting people in one room when we don't all live in the same state is really tough, but I feel like everybody actually had such a good time that they might be willing to run it back. Um, but during this era, it's actually been really cool to kind of, uh, with my own social network, and I'm sure a lot of people are experiencing this, it's actually cool to connect with people that live so far away from you. And before, it's like we always have this technology at our fingertips, but only now are we kind of realizing that we should be utilizing it in this way. But it's been so cool to be able to play these types of home games or to even play Jackbox or code names or whatever game with friends. Um, with people that live either across the country or all over the world. And so these lineups are definitely a little bit easier to put together when everyone can do it remotely. But I feel optimistic that we can make this happen live. Absolutely. And I'm just so excited for when the PokerGo studio is, is back up and running again because Poker After Dark, Friday Night Poker, and a bunch of big tournaments are all you know going to happen again. We don't know when, but they will. And I feel as though the list of phone numbers that Brent Hanks has is getting longer and longer, which makes our lineups more exciting every time we put something new together. So if you're not already a subscriber to Poker Go, I can honestly say that there is so much stuff still to catch up on before we bring out all the new stuff that it's well worth the subscription. And otherwise, you can also just keep watching this show, which I do twice a week, Tuesday morning, 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. on the East Coast. And that would make it, I want to say, 9 p.m. Central European time or Join us for happy hour, and during which, sadly, I'm having a Topo Chico because I'm doing a big cycling race. You can see the bike in the back on that side, by the way, on Saturday. Um, but yeah, I owe Maria a shot, and I'll make, make up for that uh, somewhere in the summer. Um, Damn right, you will. Yes. Uh, we have someone from Kazakhstan watching. That is awesome. I know. That is very awesome. I know Astana is a city in, in, uh, in Kazakhstan. Just showing off my geography. Um, 
here on, on the chat. Uh, all right, let's see if we have any more questions here. Wow, Dr. Roberry goes really, really deep here. This is a, this is probably a tough one. Actually, let's see how this king hand goes with Selbst and Viffer while I piece together what this question is all about. Started with about 200. 200. Thank you. If Antonio thought Ruffin was calling, he would call. You got him, all right. It's good news when I go like this. And no one will challenge Ms. Selbst. Huh. I set you up perfectly, Vanessa. You know, I talk about how you always bluff, then you pick up a big hand, you get no action. Sick. You might have, might as well just have been bluffing. Might as well have been. I know, I should have been. Andrew Robel, also part of the Ship at Halabalas. Kind of a fun book to read if you want to know more about that whole era of the young and upcoming kids playing high-stakes poker. Robel, of course, good to see you. One of those legends of the early days of, uh, of high-stakes online poker. Um, Vanessa picks up kings and get, gets no action, which is probably the saddest story of this entire episode because she's been bluffing her way through this episode, and then she finally gets a hand and she gets no action. Um, Dr. Roberry is asking, and this is a long question, so I, had to, I needed some time to put this all together. He's basically saying, you will get paid $1,000 a day for the rest of your life to never play another hand of poker. Would you take the money or would you say, ah, just give me poker? $1,000 a day? I mean, how high do people think my hourly is? <laughs> I, I, like, I, I mean, <laughs> I feel like... I feel like I would have to take the thousand dollars a day, not because I don't love poker enough, but because I feel like poker has also caused some frustrating moments for me. And I feel like I played enough poker up to this point in my life that I will definitely miss it. But there's like some downsides to playing poker as well. I mean, I feel like we've all experienced that. So it's not always, you know, what you see on TV and it's not always so glamorous and winning bracelets and w winning millions of dollars. And so I say, save a few years on my life and take the thousand dollars. Have you ever thought or considered leaving the game behind on your own terms? Does it ever cross your mind to like venture into more of a broadcasting career or focus more on that in, in the long term? Or has that poker fire always been burning for you? I've definitely considered leaving poker, but not in the sense of never really playing again. I feel like I would love to, as long as I could afford it, play the main event of the WSOP every right. year for the rest of my life. But I, I have a lot of other passions and a lot of other things that I want to pursue. And broadcasting is definitely one of them. And I am just kind of looking for a lifestyle where I won't have to travel as much. And this has just been a, a blessing in disguise, really, because with everything that's going on, I've had to force myself to slow down. And obviously traveling is not an option, period. And I, I wouldn't take that option, I think, for a while, even if it was available to me and I could feel good about it. Um, and so I think I'm just really looking forward to the next phase of my life where I can maybe still play poker, but not have the exact lifestyle that is probably unsustainable, I think, for much longer. So you and I are going to build a time machine and buy some Bitcoin about 10 years ago. And <laughs> that will. Yeah. I... It's we a big. Be... Is... Go ahead. I was just going to say we would just be mining Bitcoin. Oh, yeah. Left and right. I mean, <laughs> it's my worst, worst bad beat of all time. I had a guy I had a friend who was into Bitcoin when it was like 20 bucks. And I was like, dude, just whatever. I don't care. And yeah, look, look where I am now. Um, people, if you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook, please like the video. It really helps us. Share with your friends. Let them know that we take questions. We do this twice a week. And um, if you want to know anything more about what's coming up, just you know, always feel free to ask. Uh, they're asking for your number in the chat. I'm just going to keep that to myself. Uh, but it is, it is a good try. Uh, Sweden is in the house. India is in the house. I love the fact that we are so international. I'm from the Netherlands. Um, Maria is... is where are you anyway? Are you, are you still traveling right now, trying to you know, go back and forth, be on the beach every now and then? Or are you, have you been in the same place the entire time during quarantine? I've you know, been taking a couple drives here and there, sometimes down to Mexico to play a little bit of online poker um, and to LA to visit my family. But I feel like what this is making me realize is I really just need, I'm, my place, I have a place in Vegas that I've been, that I was at 
for, you know, maybe the first week or so of quarantine and it's super small. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> I really wish I just had a little bit of a backyard, a little bit of an outdoor space. So I think I'm really going to have to rethink that after this is over. But most of my family lives in LA. So that is where I kind of go back to and end up during all this. Well, we hope that everything is back to normal for, for everyone, you know, as soon as possible. Um, let's take a few more questions here from the people in the chat. People are wondering if you're ever going to get back to Twitch streaming, doing your own sort of online poker on there. Have you considered it? Yeah. So I, in the beginning of kind of when Twitch was blowing up, I did some streams on my own Twitch channel. I also did some streams on Poker Central's Twitch channel and I had a lot of fun interacting with everybody, but I mean, I got to keep it real. Like it does get a little bit draining to, you know, talk for six to eight hours while playing a session of poker. But if there's any time to be streaming, I feel like <laughs> now is it. So I, I feel like I don't, I don't want to make promises I can't keep, but I think there's a very good chance that the homies will see me on a Twitch stream very soon. Well, the homies are in the chat right now and they're hoping that you're back there. So uh, back in the Twitch streets. Well, so that'd be awesome if you can uh, find some time. And of course, you know, the energy to talk and play at the high level on Twitch. And I, and, I mean, everyone who does that, you know, like um, Easy With Aces and Spraggy and Lex Veldhaus, like so much respect for those people. Just both entertaining and also playing at a high level. And that's what I learned a lot, lot from watching those guys play and, and talk about the game. Uh, and I, I think that sort of goes uh, goes for many, many people. Wow, so many countries today in the chat. Really appreciate it. Uh, Toronto, we got France, we got Vermont. I love Vermont. I just ordered some maple syrup from Vermont. Um, oh, th this is a funny question, actually. Um, Brian is asking, how many royal flushes have you had in your poker career? In my poker career, I've had one royal flush, and it wasn't even one where I had two cards in my hand. It was where I had one wow. card and it was four on the board, which I feel like is really a fake royal flush. I don't even think that really counts as making a royal flush. So, I made a royal flush once in Omaha, but I had three <laughs> hearts in my hand. Yeah, I mean, that <laughs> that definitely doesn't count. <laughs> no, that didn't count, but I tried and it didn't work. Um, all right. Um, many more questions that have already been answered as well. So please go back after this broadcast is over and go back in time and, and relive all those uh, all those questions. Um, let's turn up the broadcast a little bit here and see what is happening at the poker table here on High Stakes Poker. The amateurs. They've made some timely bluffs and some good calls. Except Viffer, of course and his silly thoughts against Ruffin. Barry Greenstein decides to commit 3,000 of his 27 with ace-five suited. Barry on the short stack. <laughs> and runs into ace-king suited. But Ruffin just calls. Barry will need help on the flop. And now... He's wow. going to need a miracle, an really? actual miracle. Runner, runner, severe flood and an 8.3 earthquake ought to do it. What's the bet? Of course, he bet 5,000. Oh. And Ruffin just calls. Really? Whoa! And Barry is like, yes, my luck is finally changing. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, that's the worst. That's my biggest pet peeve. <laughs> Do you have any more? Is that it? Go straight. Flush ace high. That's all you have? That's going to win. <laughs> You guys nice hands. Yeah. When when someone when someone has the nuts and they go, how much is it? Instead of just saying call because it doesn't matter how much it is, you're calling anyway. That is one of my poker pet peeves. Oh, for sure. I I agree. But I feel like just judging by by Ruffin, <laughs> I feel like he, he it wasn't a a weird needle slow roll. <laughs> right. No, you're you're totally right. Um, what what are some of your poker pet peeves? Do you have any things that really bother you at the table? I. Okay, I do have a couple. One of them is when somebody plays a hand that someone else at the table views as 
poorly played that they must comment on it after oh. or tell everybody at the table how they would have played it differently. Uh, that really annoys me uh, for multiple reasons. I think everybody should be allowed to just play their hand the way they want to play and not really have someone try to make them feel bad about it after the fact. Um, and also, again, it's just one of those moments where people are just trying to prove that maybe they're a good poker player or that they know more. And I find that somewhat annoying. Um, I also don't like it when people just do a lot of pretend poker where they're always like, oh yeah, I had this and that. If I had called, I would have, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, let's, let's keep it moving. Yeah, I agree. Um, still the worst kind of people are the people that eat at the table. I cannot stand that when they're when they're well i mean you know I mean there's the table. There, no but there's different ways to eat at the table like you can you can <laughs> eat a bag of chips at the table and lick your fingers or you can eat with a knife and a fork and just try to be polite about it um yeah that that's the that's the kind that i'm talking about the the bad okay kind. i'm a civilized eater okay. so yeah i, I, I got you <laughs> i didn't have you pegged for the lick in the finger kind of situation oh by the way what i always like to do and i love potato chips is get chopsticks from the food court mm -hmm. and just eat them with chopsticks which is just perfect um guys Take my word for it, not just because I'm Asian. Chopsticks is a godsend. You can eat so many things with chopsticks. It's so great. And a fork just doesn't cut it sometimes, especially when you have to eat certain things at the poker table um, that are a little bit hard to pick up. So <laughs> I agree. I'm with you. I'm, I'm very happy that I've learned to eat with chopsticks quite well. The only ones that I can't handle are those, um, the ones you get at the Korean barbecue place that have the flat sides, the metal ones. Oh, yeah, yeah, they yeah. They get so slippery in my hands. And then I just, at some point, they get like a cramp in my hands from trying to like <laughs> hold on to them. Uh, and they're like extra long too. Yeah, they're super long. Yeah. But yeah, I can handle the kimchi, but I can't really turn the meat with it. <laughs> and then you, see, then you see some of these people just like, I don't know, like an, they're using it as if they're like the things attached to their, to their hand, which is, which is kind of <laughs> like scissor hands uh, style. Right. Um, We're getting to the end of this broadcast. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for watching. Season seven of High Stakes Poker, along with all the other ones, are now available on Poker Go. So if you are bored during the quarantine, please go to PokerGo.com and watch all the poker you can get. And then when the quarantine is over and the dust has settled, we're going to bring back High Stakes Poker for season eight. So... Make sure to remember that because it's going to be amazing. It's going to be epic. Maria Ho, thanks so much for being with us here on the show. I really, really appreciate it. And I, I need to have you back on again because I owe you a drink. Yeah. And question for the chat. Type in what I should make Remco drink and take a shot of the next time that I'm on because I feel like it, he deserves an appropriate punishment for wow. being on this thing today and not drinking. That is, that is, that is very, very rough. Uh, I'm, I'm going to just say that maybe somewhere... Towards the end of June, I have an idea already brewing about running back with Maria Ho themed episode. So <laughs> we'll we'll make something work in June. So yeah, let us know what I'm supposed to be drinking. Um, new season is coming when quarantine's over for the people asking in the chat. So stay tuned for much more of that. Uh, Maria, thanks once again for being with us. You guys, this was Run It Back. I am back on Tuesday, 10 a.m. Pacific time zone. So difficult. 1 p.m. Uh, on the East Coast and 9 p.m. Central European time. So an early show, especially for the people in Kazakhstan and Sweden who are watching. That is a much better hour for you guys to join us. For now, thanks for watching and we'll catch you guys next week.